Good morning. This is Criminal Behaviorology. I'm your host for Criminal Behaviorology, Timothy Joseph. It is 8.26 a.m. here in Michigan, where I have recently moved to, and uh, I think it's great. I think the the, uh, environment is uh, great with the climate, with the woodlands, with the black squirrels with the great stuff out here. I I really enjoyed it. I've looked up recently a lot of the history on on Michigan. Look up uh, look up Beaver Island. It's a small island. uh, Actually a rather extensive island with quite a a, a history uh, near Michigan. It's uh, it was had a lot of conflict. You never knew all this stuff went on in the United States until you start researching it. But uh, I had a guy declare himself king, and uh, maybe something to cover here on the on the podcast sometime. What is criminal behaviorology? Well, it is the uh, add information about criminology, about behavior analysis, and the combination of the two, and that can vary quite a bit. And we've We've covered a lot of different topics here. I'm not even sure what podcast this is, but it's a, it's about our 11th podcast, I believe. And we've covered already a variety of topics. There's a lot more to cover. There is research out there, although it's it's not uh, specific to uh, what they mentioned, criminology. But there's a lot of different areas to cover uh, that has to do with uh, vandal, everything from vandalism to antisocial behavior in schools, uh, to uh, sex offenses, and that's been uh, that's been in the news actually more than lately. It's uh, seemed like a lot of stories have been coming out about sexual offending, about uh, the Bill Cosby trial, and in the news then is uh, the Supreme Court nomination, where the issue has reared its head. Once again, this happened before with the Clarence Thomas hearings. I remember it well. So it has come up again, and some have asked me, and I've I've talked a a little bit about uh, the accusation of rape and the prevalence of the false accusation of rape. Someone tipped me off about uh, an article in... Slate Magazine at Slate.com. They have some interesting stuff on there. Uh, And this was all the way back, uh, it was four years ago. This was September 18, 2014. Article by by Kathy Young. and And the title of it is Crying Rape. Now, I've looked up some of the statistics about false allegation of rape, and there's a lot of different numbers out there. It appears to be, uh, fortunately, a relatively rare phenomenon. But uh, the prevalence of something doesn't necessarily tell us everything we need to know. We've got to get into the details. And then, uh, if we can understand the different factors involved, we can deal with it a little more effectively. And that's why I like this this particular article. It's not a scholarly article, but it is it does provide some information. So I'm going to go over uh, some of what's written here. Crying rape by Kathy Young. False rape accusations exist, and they are a serious problem. This is Slate uh, Slate.com, September 18th, 2014. In the emotionally charged conversation about rape, few topics are more fraught than that of false allegations. Consider some responses to the news that singer, songwriter, Connor Oberst had been falsely accused of sexual assault. Last December, a woman writing in the comment section, I assume this is in December 2013, comment section of the website XO Jane, going by the name Joni Faircloth, claimed Oberst raped her when she was a teenager. The charge spread across the internet. 
but Burst denied it and brought a libel suit against Faircloth when she refused to retract the story. In July, she completely recanted, admitting that she had made it all up to get attention. Yet instead of showing sympathy for the ordeal of the musician, one known for being supportive of feminist issues, some chided him for taking legal action to defend himself against a false career-damaging charge. In the Daily Dot, pop culture critic Chris Ostendorf decried the lawsuit, arguing that it could intimidate real victims of rape and that it promoted the idea of men as victims of false accusations, even though that's exactly what Oberst was. After Oberst dropped the suit, Bustles, the magazine, I suppose, B-U-S-T-L-E, Bustles, Caroline Tate, praised his decision and referred to the saga as a roller coaster for both parties, unquote, treating the false accuser and the wrongly accused as morally equivalent and called the revelation of Oberst's innocence, quote, crushingly disappointing, unquote. And, and that, I'm, I'm seeing that in a lot of these uh, people out there interested in the subject of rape, but they really are hoping something bad has happened is the is the theme of it is what I if they make a phrase like it's crushing and disappointing. Um but I'll I'll continue here. False rape accusations are a lightning rod for a variety of reasons. Rape is a repugnant repugnant crime and one for which the evidence often relies on one person's word against another's. Moreover, in the not so distant past the belief that women routinely make up rape charges often led to appalling treatment of victims. However, in challenging what author and law professor Susan Estridge has called the myth of the lying woman, feminists have been creating their own counter myth, that of the woman who never lies. More than a quarter century ago, feminist legal theorist Catherine McKinnon, M-A-C-K-I-N-N-O-N, wrote that Quote, feminism is built on believing women's accounts of sexual abuse and abuse by men, unquote. Today, Jessica Valenti urges us to, quote, believe victims en masse, unquote, because only then will we recognize the true prevalence of sexual assault. But a de facto presumption of guilt in alleged sexual offenses is as dangerous as a presumption of guilt in any crime. And for the same reasons, it depends on it upends the foundations on which our justice system rests and creates a risk of ruining innocent lives. Well, how frequent are false accusations? A commonly cited estimate, which may have originated with feminist author Susan Brown Miller in the 1970s, is that they account for only about 2% of rape reports. After the outburst fiasco, feminist blogger Rebecca Watson posted a video asserting that statistically you will be wrong two out of a hundred times if you presume a rape accusation to be true and 98 out of a hundred times if you presume it to be false. So there's the, the prevalence idea. Well, what good does that do us? What if it was only 2%? What if it's 5%? What are the individual factors in each case or what could we determine? What could we look for to ferret out? Uh, how could we verify something that think ought to be the ought to be the direction we should go in? Just looking at statistical likelihood isn't always very useful in something like this, in my opinion. In fact, as Emily Bazelon, B A Z E L O N, and Rachel Laramore wrote in Slate five years ago, official data on what law enforcement terms, quote, unfounded uh, rape reports, that is, ones in which the police department determined that no crime occurred, yield conflicting numbers depending on local police policies and procedures, averaging 8% to 10% of all reported rapes. If the truth is, the truth is even naughtier than these statistics suggest, the answer to Quote, how common are false allegations, unquote, depends largely on how false allegations are defined. Exactly. Do we count only cases in which a police report 
or a complaint to some other official authority, such as a college administrator, is shown to be deliberately false? Do we include informal word-of-mouth charges like the one against Oberst? What of he said, she said cases in which the truth is never known? Not all reports classified as unfounded were necessarily false. In some cases, women who were victims of rape were disbelieved, pressured into recanting, and charged with false reporting only to be vindicated later on. The kind of awful story that adds to people's skittishness about discussing false accusations. Some police departments have been criticized for having an anomalously high percentage of supposedly unfounded rape charges. Baltimore's unfounded rate, quote, unfounded rate, used to be the highest in the nation, at least about 30% due partly to questionable and sometimes downright abusive police procedures, such as badgering a woman about why she waited two hours to report a street assault. By 2013, an effort to provide better training and encouragement better training and encourage full investigation of all complaints reduced that rate to less than 2%. On the other hand, unfounded statistics do not capture all false allegations, only cases rejected at the earliest stage, correctly or not, because of what investigators believe to be strong proof that no crime was committed. This does not include cases in which charges are filed but rejected for prosecution between a quarter and nearly half of all cases, or the relatively small number of prosecutions that end in dismissal or acquittal. Of course, not all such cases involve innocent defendants, probably not even most, but surely some do. A similar pattern can be found in recent study often cited as evidence of rarity of false accusations. A 2010 paper by psychologist David Lisak, L-I-S-A-K, which examined all 136 sexual assault reports made on a Northeastern University campus over a 10-year period. For 19 of these cases, the files did not contain enough information to evaluate the outcome. Of the 117 cases that could be classified, 8 or 6.8% were determined to be false complaints. That conclusion was reached when there was substantial evidence refuting the complaints, the complainant's account. But does it mean that 93% of reports could be evaluated were shown to be truthful? More than 40% of the reports evaluated in LISAC's study, excluding the ones for which there was not enough information to classify them, did result in disciplinary or criminal charges. However, 52% were investigated and closed. LISAC told me, the, the author of this article, that the vast majority of these complaints did not proceed due to insufficient evidence often because the complainant had stopped cooperating with investigators. His paper also mentions another type of complaint that did not proceed, cases in which the, quote, incident did not meet the legal elements of the crime of sexual assault, unquote. Lisak was unable to provide any specifics on the incidents, but in other known cases, such allegations stem from conflicting definitions of what constitutes rape and consent, particularly in sexual encounters that involve alcohol. Scandal at Ohio University last fall is an example of this. I do have a correction for that. Uh, the article misidentified Ohio University as the University of Ohio at Athens. They corrected that error. A female student who was caught on camera in a drunken public sex act, which bystanders of both sexes had perceived as consensual, then filed a rape complaint after photos and video that showed her receiving oral sex from a male student became an internet hit. The woman who claimed she had no memory of the event received strong support from feminist activists on campus and was vilified as a liar on men's rights websites. War of the websites. Ultimately, the grand jury cleared the man, concluding that both parties were drunk. The woman was not incapacitated. She walked away unassisted and bought a burrito moments after the encounter and was a willing participant. 
The district attorney also declined to charge either party with public indecency commenting that the embarrassment was punishment enough. Did the young woman lie to salvage her reputation? Of course, we do not know. It may be that she thought that any level of intoxication renders consent invalid, as many campus programs are teaching today. We have some links for that in the article. But as sociologist Kathleen Bogle and law professor Ann Coughlin recently noted in Slate, this is far from the legal standard for incapacitation required in a criminal finding of sexual assault. Even, even assuming the female student genuinely believed that what happened was rape, it was still, as the investigation concluded, a wrongful accusation, one that won't be recorded as an unfounded rape report by the FBI. So why is it necessary for us to have a clearer picture of the scope of false allegations if most allegations are not intentionally false? We are not, as some anti-feminist blogs assert, in the midst of a massive epidemic of rape hoaxes, but wrongful accusations either deliberately made up or based on gray area cases that may hinge on mixed signals, alcohol-addled memories, or misunderstandings of what constitutes sexual assault are not the are not the almost non-existent anomaly advocates for victims often acclaim. They can be cries for attention and sympathy or attempts to cover up embarrassing sexual encounters, such as the 2009 Hofstra University case in which a female student's claim of gang rape in a men's group fell apart after a cell phone video taken by one of the accused men showed consensual group sex or vendettas against former partners. At whatever rate such cases occur, they should not be dismissed as statistical blips. These lies have tragic results. Two years ago, a former California high school football star, Brian Banks, who spent five years in prison for raping his classmate Juanita Gibson, was exonerated after Gibson contacted him to apologize and admitted making up the attack. In 2009, New Yorker William McCaffrey was released after serving four years of a 20-year prison sentence for a rape his friend, Bernie Figaro, B-I-U-R-N-Y-P-E-G-U-E-R-O, were made up to explain her injuries from a fight with several women. In 2012, a Michigan man, James Grissom, was freed after nearly 10 years in prison when the woman who accused him, Sarah Gillan, was caught making up another false allegation and faking cancer to build money from insurance companies and sympathetic donors. Even without a wrongful conviction, the consequences of a false allegation can be devastating, from a terrifying middle-of-the-night arrest to a lengthy pre-trial detention, among other things. Cultural unease about the issue of false accusation is understandable, given how the crying rape trope has been historically linked with misogynist stereotypes of women as devious, crazy, or both. The old assumption about women's propensity to lie about rape led to sexist laws that required men to, women to be bruised, bloodied, or chased to prove that they were attacked. Even now, this topic attracts woman haters, such as the men's rights activists, that's in quotes, who misidentified an Ohio University student as the accuser in the caught on video case last fall and suggested that even if he had the wrong woman, it was appropriate payback for calumnies against innocent males. But, quote, believe the victim, do quote, dogma, and the resistance to seeing false accusations as a real problem can also create a dangerous environment. It is a climate in which a law mandating, mandating an impossibly vague, quote, affirmative consent, unquote, standard in campus sexual assault cases can be defended on the grounds that false complaints are a non-issue. It is a climate in which exoneration is often presumed to be a miscarriage of justice, like when earlier this year activists at Dartmouth were dismayed at a student's acquittal, even though his story of clumsy, drunken sex 
was backed by substantial evidence. In this climate, a man can be publicly vilified on the basis of an anonymous accusation on the internet nearly a decade after the alleged rape. Even as the allegation against Oberst crumbled, another such charge gained traction. This one against Max Temkin, T-E-M-K-I-N, co-creator of the indie game Cards Against Humanity. I've seen that game played. Temkin's accuser, a former fellow student at Goucher College who calls herself Mags, M-A-G-Z, that's in quotes, says she spent years blaming herself for the attack, of which she has given no specifics, until she was finally emboldened to come forward by the story shared in the Yes All Women hashtag. Yes All Women is one word. Temkin, who says that Mags first began to accuse him after seeing him profiled in a newspaper, maintains that the two had brief consensual relationship that stopped short of intercourse and that he broke off in a rather insensitive way. Most of the public responses were scathing toward Temkin. Filmmaker Kelly Ken speculated that both Temkin and Mags were telling the truth, but he had misread her signals, making him an unwitting rapist. Comedian and culture blogger Arthur Chu called Temkin's categorical denial of guilt vague and deflecting. In a much harsher comment, game maker Ryan Macklin slammed Temkin's attempt to defend himself as vile and called the mere mention of a libel suit a metaphorical threat of rape. In late August, Temkin was disinvited from the XOXO Festival an event celebrating independently produced art and technology after some social media complaints about promoting a rapist. We don't know whether Temkin is a victim of false allegation. We also don't know whether Mags is a victim of rape. We don't know and will probably never know, barring a confession from him or a recantation from her. But the rush to condemn Temkin and support Mags starkly illustrates both power both the power and the peril of unproven accusations. Our focus on getting justice for women who are sexually assaulted is necessary and right. We are still far from the day when every woman who makes a rape accusation gets a proper police investigation and a fair hearing. But seeking justice for female victims should make us more sensitive, not less to justice for fairly unfairly accused men. In practical terms, the means finding ways to show support for victims of sexual violence without equating accusation and guilt and recognizing that the wrongly accused are real victims too. It means not assuming that only a conviction that only a conviction is a fair outcome for an alleged sex crime. It means finally rejecting laws and policies rooted in the assumption that wrongful accusations are so vanishingly rare they needn't be a cause for concern. To put it simply, we need to stop presuming guilt. Well, how did we ever get here? Uh, I, I think that the uh, presumption of innocence is uh, really a, a height, uh, a level of progress for civilization that is uh, really a sacred thing. If I'm, you know, not to be too, uh, not to be too bold about it, I think it's one of the most important things civilization has ever created is the presumption of innocence. I think that. Original Miranda decision was uh, one of the best legal decisions ever, where the authorities, if they come to arrest you, uh, they have to tell you what your rights are, to put it very, very simply. In, in other words, it's, it's presuming the accused people have rights, and somehow... Uh, it seems like we're getting a little bit away from that, at least in a, at least in the context of these kinds of allegations. It, it seems very similar, by the way, to years ago. Do you know about the, the, McMartin, allegations of sexual abuse that involved a dramatic two-year trial in California, and it, uh, it started out from accusations that I think had very little foundation. But it turned into a, a group of people at a daycare center going through a legal nightmare. You might want to look that up. You 
you can even post that in the McMartin uh, sex abuse case. So this discussion can go in a lot of different directions, so I'm digressing a little bit here. I will say, I, I want to conclude this, there is the uh, National Criminal Justice Reference Service has a an abstract and it's really good article from uh, Practical Aspects of Rape Investigation. It's a book, actually. Uh, Robert R. That's Roy Hazelwood. Those uh, know about FBI. I've been to a couple of his trainings. And Ann Wolbert Burgess. Uh, this is uh, False Allegations from Practical Aspects of Rape Investigation. Uh, that book is from 1987, pages 275 to 299. Uh, the abstract, I, I include this because this is now giving us some good information to work with. On the, uh, to look at this in terms of behavior, what do we need to look for with false allegations? Is there ways to determine behaviorally? Uh, and then what, it, what would be the motive for something like this? So we can, we can address this topic more intelligently than just saying, you know, you believe one side or the other. False rape allegations are usually efforts to bolster eroding self-esteem by denying personal responsibility for failure, projecting one's problems on others, escaping accountability, rationalizing to make negative actions appear reasonable, and handicapping to justify poor life performance. The false allegation may involve self-inflicted injuries. Some indications of false rape allegations are delayed reporting, complainant indifference to apparent injuries, a vague description of the rapist or a claim not to have seen him, evidence inconsistent with the alleged victim's story, extensive injuries that do not involve sensitive tissues, and fingernail scrapings that reveal the victim's own skin. False allegations may also be suspected when they are in the context of stresses in the victim's personal relationships. The complainant has a history of emotional problems, and the complainant has a previous record of having been assaulted or raped under similar circumstances. When a false allegation is suspected by the investigator, inconsistencies in the victim's story should be, support, should be noted in a supportive manner. Any doubts expressed by the investigator should be based on objective evidence. In a supportive presence, the victim is likely to admit truth and seek solace. Now there's a, there's a little more, that's a little more like it, like how to address a matter like this in an effective way. Uh, we don't want uh, actual rape cases to fall under suspicion or someone to unfairly be accused of making a false allegation. All those things in the Hazelwood Burgess uh, book that were listed, those could be in real life cases. So you look at the totality of the evidence and you approach things carefully because uh, false allegations are, uh, are a problem as well, even if they are rare. Because our ultimate goal is to use methods to get to the truth. And then an even greater goal is the reduction of violence. That's a, a goal of uh, criminal behaviorology, ultimately. So I, uh, those are my thoughts on that. It's a timely topic. Perhaps uh, you have some thoughts on it. You can respond on the Facebook page or on Potomatic or on, uh, uh, write an email, criminalbehaviorology at gmail.com. This is Timothy Joseph for Criminal Behaviorology. Have a great rest of your day.